uh, thank, thank you very much, and thank you all uh, for coming out. Um, this, it's, it's great to be here, and, and uh, I hope uh, you enjoy the talk and that it leads to um, some productive uh, discussion afterwards. Uh, I'm excited to see some young members in the audience here, too, <laughs> making me wish I brought my own kids. Um, okay, so uh, I'll start just by with an acknowledgement. So in the uh, time-honored tradition of professors, I've, I've uh, stolen almost all my slides from a graduate student. Um, so I just wanted to, to acknowledge uh, Andrew Agee, who, who has a great slide deck for this talk that he helped me put together and uh, was one of the graduate students who helped lead this work. Um, okay, so I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to start with kind of a, a high-level uh, discussion of, of of what is cancer uh, and how it relates to the genome, um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, uh, a, a kind of a different a different arc or a different storyline, which is that of Henrietta Lacks and the history of the Gila uh, cell line, um, and then I'll intersect these two topics and talk about our own work um, with the Gila genome and some of the controversies and, and interesting issues that, that, that this raised uh, over the course of, of this year, 2013. And then I'll talk a little about where this is headed in hopes of uh, hopefully provoking some discussion. So um, kind of uh, just stepping back at a, at a very um, high level, uh, what is cancer? Right, so we're all composed of, of a gazillion cells. And in normal tissue, healthy, healthy cells communicate with one another um, and are able to know when to stop growing. Right? So in the case of a, uh, a wound, um, so for example, if you get a cut, uh, your cells also know through communication that there is uh, uh, something there that needs to be filled in, and they can divide and, and, and fill into that and repair the wound, um, and then stop dividing once the wound is, is healed. Right? So, um, okay. So, what, what is actually in cells, right? What, what are they um, composed of? So um, the, the workhorses of, of cells are proteins, right? So there are about 20,000 different kinds of proteins in our body. Um, and these are essentially the, the, the macromolecules that do everything. Um, and uh, there's a balance of these working together, acting together in particular cell types to do whatever that cell does. Um, but what makes the proteins, or what encodes the proteins? Um, that is uh, the genome, right? So um, each of us has, in every cell in our bodies, 23 pairs of chromosomes, um, so the indicated here by the, the red and blue. And each of these pairs, so, so one member of the pair effectively is inherited from your mom, and one member effectively inherited from your dad, right? And these 23 pairs or the genome and provide a blueprint, this DNA provides a blueprint for building the proteins, right? So the DNA encodes the proteins, which in turn are the workhorses for, for, for biology or for our, our, um, everything that goes on in us. Okay, so what happens in cancer? So effectively, um, you can have what are called mutations in the genome, right? This is when the sequence of the DNA changes in one or several places. Um, and uh, occasionally when those mutations happen, they lead to a gene that should be off turning on or a gene that should be on turning off. Uh, and as a consequence, the proteins encoded by particular genes um, may, may be present when they're not supposed to be present or absent when they are supposed to be present. And effectively, this fine machinery becomes imbalanced. Um, and that can, uh, in certain circumstances, throw off uh, some of this communication between cells, right? That, tell, that instructs cells when to stop growing um, uh, or, or stop dividing. So, um, you know, again, starting from these mutations in the genome, you, you get this uh, screwed up ability to communicate um, intracellularly, and um, one cell, effectively, that has the right combination of mutations can act selfishly, growing um, when it's not supposed to grow, dividing uncontrollably, and eventually leading into a primary cancer or tumor, which can then metastasize to other parts of the body. Um, okay, so, but the, 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 the key point I wanna communicate with this first part of the talk here is that 
what's really underlying everything that goes wrong is mutations in this blueprint, right? So alterations to um, the genome. So, so each of us, um, so, so the genome is effectively like a three billion uh, uh, character long string in an alphabet with four letters. So just A, G, C's, and T's. So it's like a binary computer code of zeros and ones, except rather than just two symbols, there are four symbols. Um, and uh, each, of us, e each of us is virtually identical, right? So if I was to compare my genome to the genome of anyone in this room, I would only find about three million differences. So the genome is three billion base pairs long, so we're effectively 99.9% .9 identical, right? Um, if I were to do the same comparison to a chimpanzee, it would be about 15 times as much difference to give you some sense of scale. Um, okay, so in a cancer genome, you effectively have the accumulation of mutations on top of those mutations, including ones in genes that can potentially lead to cancer. Um, that's not the only thing that happens. So you can have these uh, you know, changes in the sequence. You can also have entire chromosomes that increase in number, right? So just to show you an example of this, um, this is what's called a karyotype of the HeLa genome where we're looking at um, uh, effectively painted chromosomes of, of, you know, again, one to 23. Um, but as you can see, there's not just pairs, right? So rather than two, in most cases, we have three copies of each chromosome. In some cases, we have four or five or six. And, and many of these alterations in copy number are also contribute to um, the development of cancer. Okay, so take home point, cancer is fundamentally a disease of the genome. Um, and also, every cancer is unique, right? So every cancer contains a unique constellation of mutations um, that underlie its, its development, and certainly there are commonalities amongst different cancers, particularly of the same type. So if I were to compare a thousand breast cancers, I would see things in common between them, but nonetheless, they each often have quite uh, unique signatures. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears here and talk uh, a little about um, Henrietta Lacks um, and the establishment of the, the HeLa cell line. Uh, so who was Henrietta Lacks? So um, she was a woman uh, living in the, in the south in the, the um, uh, earlier part of the 20th century. Um, in uh, the late 40s, um, and, uh, she developed uh, cervical uh, cancer and she was uh, treated seen and treated at Johns Hopkins um, University. And this was, a, this was a very different time in our country and, and in medicine as well. So there were segregated wards um, at, at Hopkins, for example, and many other parts of the country. Um, and um, in 1951, she, she passed away um, from this cancer. So uh, this fellow is, is George Gay, who is a um, researcher at Johns Hopkins University. And during the course of her treatment um, at Johns Hopkins, um, her tumor was removed. And at the time, um, there was an intense effort in science to establish cell line models for humans, right? So the idea is that could you take cells from a person and grow them in a Petri dish? This is called cell culture. And we do it today all the time, but in 1950, no one had done it with human cells. They had done it with mouse, suggesting it was possible, um, but obviously there was great interest in, in doing this for humans. So they would, they would take tumor samples from many of the patients being seen at Hopkins, and um, this person was effectively running a factory trying very hard to get one of these things to grow in a dish. And it turned out with Henrietta Lacks' cells from her cancer, this actually took off uh, and, and grew like wildfire. Um, so, uh, an important thing to note here is that no formal consent was given by her or her family to utilize um, her, uh, her, the specimen for research. Um, it's, it's not 100% that she even was told. Um, and at the time, the, the, the standards for, for patient consent were, were very different, right? So um, they, were not, they were not breaking the norm of what was standard in 1951. Uh, to do. So this cell line just took off, 
right? It grew, it, it grew like, you know, they, they basically describe it as growing like wildfire. Um, and uh, it, it was effectively the first human cells that were immortalized, meaning that they could propagate indefinitely without ever stopping. Um, and uh, that was in 1951. Um, so over the next few years, uh, George Gay distributed the cells to anyone who requested them. They would just drop them in an envelope and put them in the mail. Um, and so these got widely distributed across, across the country. Um, and as a result, uh, Gila was, was in those early days and, and perpetuating into today, um, the most widely used cell line in, in medical research. So if you look at citations, um, this is in PubMed, which is a catalog of publications, um, that mention the word Gila in the abstract. Um, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's going up and up and up. Collectively, there are around 75,000 publications. Uh, but that's just the ones that name it in the abstract. So the actual number that use Gila in somewhere in the paper is, you know, who knows how many. But it, it's, it's um, clearly uh, been used a lot. Um, just a few examples of, of ways that it's been used. Um, Jonas Salk uh, used Gila in the, in the early 50s as part of developing um, and, and growing up, um, uh, te testing and growing up large amounts of the polio vaccine. Uh, and, in, and it's been used in, in myriad other ways. Um, it's kind of the, you know, I referred earlier to the fact that this is an incredibly proliferative cell line. Um, Stan Gartler, who's actually here at the University of Washington, uh, was, al was also here in the, in the 60s. He just celebrated his 90th birthday um, earlier this year. Uh, so in the mid-60s, um, you know, so after the establishment of HeLa, many other groups tried to develop cell lines based on other tissues, right? So we want to study the liver, so we build a cell line based on the liver. We want to study the brain, so we get neurons and establish a cell line. And so there, there are many groups reporting that they had established cell lines from various tissues. And what, what, what uh, uh, Stan showed uh, in, a, in what was apparently a very unpopular talk um, was that all of these purported uh, cell lines were actually HeLa. Um, it was growing so, so quickly that it would effectively contaminate um, other attempts to build cell lines and take over the cultures and folks would think if they were working with neurons or neuron derivatives, but in fact they were just looking at HeLa. Um, okay, so in the in the late '60s and early '70s, I think in part as a consequence of the the pervasiveness with which the cell line was being used, and kind of the the continuing lack of appropriate guidelines around um, privacy, uh, and also the fact that they had named the cell line after the first. You know, effectively after the initials of the patient, um, it was revealed um, in a series of magazine articles in the popular press that Henrietta Lacks uh, was the, the donor, um, uh, or, or was, the, was the source of, of the sales. Um, and you know, there are a number of, of, of things that in retrospect were, were quite wrong that occurred um, during this period, including um, follow-up uh, testing on family members that was done without um, uh, full disclosure of, of why they were doing it. Um, okay, so so kind of uh, a related aside that might come up later in the in the discussion and, and also involved Gila was a very prominent case um, that went to the Supreme Court, uh, Moore versus the reagents of the University of California, um, and and basically the, the the question that the court was faced with was, does a patient own the rights to samples that came from them, right? So if I give blood to a doctor and uses it for research and it ends up resulting in a multi-million dollar drug, do I have any claim or stake because that was my sample, right? And in some cases, there are patients who are very unique and it's because they are unique genetically or otherwise and their immune response or whatever it is that makes it possible to, to develop the drug or the test or whatever it is. And so, um, th those were some of the issues brought up in this case, and, and HeLa was brought up as part of this discussion, um, uh, you know, cells being used for for-profit research. And the court decided, um, and I think this still stands today, is that patient tissue is effectively declared medical waste and is no longer the property of the patient. So a patient has no rights to that, um, 
uh, material or to, to um, intellectual property that may derive from it. Um, okay, so fast forwarding even further uh, in the interest of time. Um, uh, again, although her identity was, was known in the popular press through, through publications in the uh, uh, late 60s and early 70s, this story became um, broadly known uh, through a, a, a bestseller book. It's a very good book. I, hope, I assume or hope that at least some people here have read it, The Immortal Life of uh, Henrietta Lacks by uh, Rebecca Skloot. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna bore you with too many details of the science, but I do wanna, of course, talk about a little of what we did in terms of sequencing the genome and, and what made it possible and what we found. So one trend that I'll come back to um, a little bit later is that in the past 10 years or so, right, so the Human Genome Project was uh, completed around 2003. Um, this was a billion dollar effort involving many countries and a thousand academics. Um, and, and the cost of sequencing uh, DNA had dropped uh, in part because of that project. But you can see that this is a log scale here, right? So we're looking at a, a log drop. And this is Moore's law, right? So the idea that semiconductor uh, densities double every 18 months or whatever. Um, so just plotting that same trend. So over the course of a decade, the cost of DNA sequencing has dropped by a factor of over 10,000 fold, right? So whereas um, towards the conclusion of the Human Genome Project, if I wanted to sequence your genome, it would have cost me somewhere between 10 million and 100 million dollars. Today, it costs about 3,000 bucks, right? So, so that kind of dramatic um, change has happened. And so this is, this is in part because of the introduction of what are called massively parallel technologies for DNA sequencing. And so um, what I'm showing here uh, is one ten thousandth of the full area of a microscope slide. Right, and each of these is gonna give a, a DNA sequencing read. Right? So we've effectively lowered the cost of sequencing by, by just utterly parallelizing um, the process so that we can sequence um, millions and billions of molecules on a slide in a single experiment. And so that, that's what gives rise to this trend. And so this is, this is transforming biomedical science like as we speak, right? So, um, not just the study of you know, your genome or my genome, right? So for example, um, we are, uh, there are new insights into to things like autism and intellectual disability that come from uh, sequencing whole genomes of individuals and looking for mutations that might contribute to those uh, diseases, but also in cancer, where the community is sequencing thousands of cancers genomes to look for differences between the cancer genome and the normal genome and to find what differences might underlie the proliferation. Right? And so what we set out to do with HeLa about two years ago was to try and do a very good job of sequencing this one genome. Um, and in part, it was because the genome was so complex, uh, very widely used, um, and we thought there'd be some interesting biology there. So one thing to keep in mind is that we are not sequencing the, we are not directly sequencing the genome of Henrietta Lacks, right? So Henrietta Lacks, like all of us, had a diploid genome with two chromosomes, or, or a pair of, uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, she developed a cancer, which was likely, uh, had, had many aberrations in copy number. And then this, this was tr turned into a cell line, which has been propagated for 50 years, right? So one of the challenges here is figuring out whether what we're looking at today reflects changes that have accumulated over 50 years of being a cell line or represent what, what actually was present in Henrietta Lacks' tumor. Um, and, and so um, our approach to this was to, and I won't talk about any of this in detail, was to throw at, like, essentially the, everything in the kitchen sink at this, right? So every technology um, that we had access to in our lab, uh, we tried to apply to this to try and generate um, what we like to think is, is probably the most comprehensively sequenced um, single cancer genome to date. Um, and so if you think about what a normal genome looks like, so if I were to sequence your genome, so the red and the blue are the pairs, these are 23 chromosomes, and you can see you know, every chromosome has one uh, red and one blue. Um, 
the, the HeLa genome is highly what's called aneuploid. And what that means is that for virtually all chromosomes, uh, there are more or less than two copies. Uh, in many cases, copies, you know, one a maternal copy or paternal copy has been entirely lost. Um, in some cases, parts of the genome have been highly amplified, so there are many, many copies. Okay, so um, a little background on cervical cancer. So the vast majority of cervical cancer is caused by a virus called human papillomavirus. Uh, this, is, this is hopefully um, going away over time now that there are vaccines against this. Um, but what human papillomavirus does is effectively insert its genome into the genome of the host. Right, so in a cell in the cervix, the, the HPV genome is inserted into the human genome and alters expression of certain genes in a way that leads to all of these other mutations in cancer. And so one of the things we were able to do is to look in great detail at exactly how the viral genome inserted into uh, her genome. Um, and it turned out to be incredibly complex. Right? So um, a remarkable amounts of rearrangement of sequences, deletions and amplifications, um, and also very unusual. So this is not necessarily the typical pattern by which HPV inserts into a genome. Um, and then uh, kind of through a variety of other techniques, as well as some other data that have been generated on HeLa, uh, one of the things that we're able to show is that there, there's a gene, uh, so, so we can, we're able to find exactly where in the genome uh, HeLa, uh, uh, papillomavirus had inserted itself, so here on chromosome 8. And then we're also able to show that it was actually looping to another part of the genome and turning on a cancer gene. So um, uh, we think that this specific mechanism of, of looping and activating of this MYC cancer gene or oncogene uh, might be what in part explains why this particular cancer took off so quickly. Right? So why it has unusual properties with respect to its proliferativeness and so on and so forth. Okay, so coming back to the, the history here, so uh, where I left off, um, the, the book had been published in 2010. Um, you know, we, we worked on this for several years. We submitted a paper uh, to, to Nature, and of course, as, as luck always has it, on the same day our paper is accepted, we get scooped, right? Um, and a, a German group um, published a, a sequence of a different strain of HeLa, um, uh, and, and not only published the, 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 the paper, but also took all the data and deposited it online, right, to a publicly available space. And so, um, and you should bear in mind, this is the standard practice in the field, right? So many journals actually would require for publication that you do this, that you put the data online. And there's lots of other HeLa data already online. So I'm not, I'm not trying to blame them as having crossed some, some red line that, that the field had not already kind of crossed, um, but it did, it did get communicated back to the family that this had happened and um, they were quite upset. Um, and so, and so uh, uh, this is our paper which, which came out later in the fall. Um, over, over the course of the, the summer, um, this, this summer, this, uh, there was a series of uh, discussions between Francis Collins, who is the director of the uh, uh, NIH, um, one of his colleagues, Kathy Hudson, and the Lacks family about, about what exactly to do. And I think the, the essential problem here was that, and, and Kathy Hudson is the one who I think articulated this best in a commentary about this, is that this sort of pitted, this, this controversy pits two of the things that the NIH or, or, or our research community holds most dear against each other, right? So. The field of genomics has always been very um, all about open data sharing, releasing data as soon as it's generated, open access, um, the ability to replicate each other's results. And this is, this is part of the ethos of the Human Genome Project and part of why our field works. Um, at the same time, uh, both the NIH as well as the genomics field also cares a lot about patient privacy. And so you have these two issues directly colliding with each other. Um, and so, uh, these, these conversations over the course of the summer um, 
uh, were very productive and, and ultimately led to a resolution where the family um, uh, consented to data from both groups being put in a secure repository where researchers could get access to it with approval from a committee and where, and I think in a, what, what's an unprecedented arrangement, members of the family sit on the committee that reviews requests uh, to use the data. Um, and so uh, a key point is this is not precedent setting because the historical circumstances of, of Gila are somewhat unique, but I think it, it brings to the forefront a lot of issues about, uh, that, that relate to genomics that are really gonna be um, important in the decade ahead. So I'll just close on some of those points. So uh, where is this headed? So as I mentioned, um, the cost of genome sequencing is plummeting. Uh, the number of genomes that have been sequenced, uh, human genomes have been sequenced worldwide is easily in the tens of thousands now and, and, and skyrocketing rather quickly. And I think the other trend that is, is um, concurrent with this is that the relevance of genomics to medicine is increasing, right? So um, uh, genomics is important in every part of the, you know, every part of life, right? So everything from conception to pregnancy to, to childhood to, you know, cancer in adulthood and, uh, you know, preconception, pre, pre IVF, screening, things like that. It's relevant across the board. And as we increasingly understand the genetic basis of human disease, having genetic information to inform uh, healthcare decisions and, and, and other things like that is gonna be increasingly common. Um, and so I, I think this is, this is going to be an issue in, in um, the coming years as this kind of data is generated on, on more and more people. So um, just kind of a few of the issues that have come up in the context of this discussion with the, the, um, with the Lacks family, right? So as I mentioned, this conflict between open data sharing and patient privacy uh, uh, for, for research of, of um, the genomes of, of patients. Um, just talking about what are the risks of having your genome known with the family, right? Is there a real risk or is that overblown? Um, who owns a genome? Right? Do they own the genome of their deceased mother? Um, uh, what is informed consent in this context and other contexts? Um, and really, can we, can we guarantee the anonymity of anyone, right, if, if genetic data is, is available? Um, okay, so that's food for thought. Um, I'll just close by uh, acknowledging the Lacks family and Henrietta Lacks, um, who this study would not have um, been possible without. And then uh, the three graduate students, Andrew Aidey and Josh Burton and Jake, Jacob Kissman, who um, led all the work that I get to talk about. So, uh, and I'll stop there and um, let's take our break.